this is probably the most requested subject I've gotten, which is cool that people are interested. Um, but before I start, there's just a couple disclaimers. Um, if you follow me for the loud, wet synth farts, there's going to be none of that in this one, so you can skip it. Um, and I built this workflow and Reaper setup around sound design for game audio and asset generation in particular. So if you're more into linear work, some of this stuff might not directly translate because it wasn't specifically made for that purpose. And I wasn't sure which elements people were most interested out of the whole Reaper setup. So I figured I would just cover everything and then you can use the chapter markers to skip around to the parts that you're most interested in. So without further ado, I figured we dive right into my overall Reaper window layout. Uh, we'll start in the upper left-hand corner. Wait, hold on one second. And I can make it so it looks like I'm looking at what I'm talking about. Cool. Starting up here, we have my floating Docker window. Um, all these are just floating windows that I have saved to their positions using screen sets. This includes the Media Explorer, which I don't use that often because I use SoundMiner for the most part. My Actions List, which I do use pretty often. Video Track, which I use when I have videos in my session, which is occasionally. Effects Browser, which I use most often. And Project Bay, which I reach for every once in a while. Um, so honestly, more often than not, it's on my Effects Browser. Just below that, we have my first floating toolbar. All these buttons are mostly custom actions, macros, and shortcuts for scripts. I'll dive more into that later because we don't need to go through every single button. And then just below that, I've actually done a dedicated video on both of these analyzer windows. This first one is a spectrum analyzer, and the second one is a stereo width analyzer. You can see them at work if I play back some audio. I find that when I'm like uh, either listening on headphones or speakers or working from home or in the office, uh, having both of these analyzers always open keeps me honest. And, and when I naturally want to make things full spectrum or as wide as they can be, because that just sounds good a lot of the time, this makes me conscious and aware of the decisions that I'm making, which is a good reminder. And then at the top of my main window, we got like my project tabs. I usually have a few of those open at once and drag things between them. We got the transport. It's pretty small because I don't usually use the transport. I just like to know if like playback is engaged or not, um, if looping is enabled or not, and my time code, which is sometimes important, but usually not. And then what's far more important than that is this uh, the script I have here, which is Nick NVK's uh, Create, uh, which is really great. And I use all of his scripts. I'll show you more of them later. But this one in particular just keeps like a live buffer of all the audio that's going through my session. It allows me to just like take something that I've heard and grab it and drop it right in. So for example, let's say I was messing with this file with playback active. That sounds like absolute trash, but let's say I really enjoyed that. Um, I can just go ahead and grab it and drag it in and then hear it again. With all the clicks and everything. Lovely. It wasn't the best demonstration, but I think you can imagine how that's really useful. Below that, we have uh, some more buttons. Again, these are just like custom stuff for the most part. I'll show my template afterwards, but this is like my main working area. I usually use widescreen, in which case this is all stretched out. So this is probably like occupying more of the screen space. And then on the right side here, we got my monitor effects. This is where I have NVK record, which feeds into the buffer um, and my analyzers. And I have insight. I don't really use insight with this layout, but it's nice to have sometimes. Um, and then just below that, this is my master track right here. Um, it's good to see the overall level of things like you can see right here. It shows the true peak level, which is good, especially to know if I'm clipping. I have a couple things in place to make sure that doesn't happen, but just in case. And I'll usually, as I'm working, I'll switch mono on and off. And I also like to mess with the master output volume. Um, it helps a lot as you're working on assets to, you know, again, keep yourself honest to like drop the volume by 10 dB. And having the master fader here on hand just really helps with that. The last thing that I want to mention about my overall layout is uh, the theme, which is it's technically custom, but it's just a subtle little tweak. The default uh, six Reaper theme, the dark one looks more like this, um, which has like a different track control panel layout. And the waveforms are like green when they're not selected and they turn dark when they're selected. Um, and like the buttons look slightly different. So I just went ahead and tweaked things to what I liked and then saved it. Saved as my own theme because I like seeing the waveforms in like a uniform color like that. What you're looking at here is basically my default template setup um, without these sample sounds right here. 
Um, I'm just going to run you down what all the different tracks do. Um, and this is basically my starting point for all my sessions. So at the top here, um, sorry, let me just move my face out of the way again. Um, this is my ref MOV track, it stands for reference video or reference movie. Um, when I am working to video for individual assets, um, I'll have the little capture located up here. This is just like a returnal sample video. Um, and you'll notice that although there's audio on this, it's not sending to the master output. That's intentional. Um, I have it, this box here unchecked by default. Master send enabled is disabled at the moment. Um, and that's to make sure that when I go to bounce assets, it doesn't include anything from the reference track unintentionally. Um, if I want to hear it briefly, I have like a little command set up to do that, to toggle that on and off. So usually I want to keep it off. Um, just below there, I have my ref bus, which is my reference bus. This usually has assets from um, other media that I, uh, again, it's about like keeping perspective, right? I picked up this trick from, from Mastering Engineers, how they always keep tracks that have what they're going for in mind in the session. And it's really helpful to just have these available to me so I can look at the waveforms and see how they show up on the spectrum analyzer and the stereoscope so that as I'm designing sounds like that's the super cool, oh my God, so amazing Lucio Reload sound that blows my mind every time I hear it. Um, and then right below that, let's say I'm designing a reload sound myself. It just helps to have like something to measure against. Oh yeah, by the way, these are always muted by default. So the only way to make them audio audible is to selectively solo them. Just below that, we have my mix bus track, which is uh, the highest level parent of my track hierarchy where I'm actually like working and designing stuff. All that's going on here is a pro L set to the safe mode no input gain and set to minus 0 0.5 with the true peak limiting setting on. Um, and this is really just to make sure that like if things ever get crazy, it never clips because all of my working tracks um, feed into this one before going to the master output. So it's sort of like my pre-master track if you want to think of it that way. And it just keeps things from going above zero, which is always helpful. Um, below that, this parent and like the 10 children underneath it is sort of like my track template for when I'm designing a singular asset. I usually like to start with 10 tracks because it keeps me from going overboard. And the effects that are present here on the, on the parent for these is a Saturn set to the clean tube mode with zero drive and just like minus one on the output. And then that feeds into a Pro L that's just like completely zeroed out with the modern setting, just because I think it sounds pretty nice as a starting point. This again is to make sure that like, as I'm designing assets, they never clip. Even if the gain goes above zero, it will soft clip into Saturn first before going into the limiter. Um, and that just helps me keep loudness under control. Below that are all the subtracks where I'll actually like put in sounds and like design the asset and I'll build effects on these as I go. When I'm ready to design like the second asset in my session, I have a hotkey set up to basically load that track template um, up as many times as I need. And then I also have a handy dandy little uh, hotkey to randomize the colors um, because I like being able to differentiate things at a glance. Part of the reason that I have the structure set up this way with like the, the little parents and the subfolders underneath that is because I use the NVK workflow uh, script and specifically the NVK folder items uh, script every single day. <laughs> it's really important and it helps me export assets very, very quickly. Um, so once I'm done designing and I have all my layers here, I'll just create the folder items and that automatically creates a container on the parent track. I'm not going to go into the details about NVK folder items because he's done a much better tutorial on that. Um, but in general, my session will have like a bunch of folder items where I'm ready to export. And then I'll click the export button and it won't let me do anything because I'm recording the VO for this YouTube video in a different session. Uh, but usually it allows me to do like a big batch export for all the assets in my session all at once, which is very, very handy. Something else you might have seen me using from time to time is this radial menu, which is the script. It's called Loka Senna um, Radial Menu. It was not created by me. It was created by this talented individual who goes by Loka Senna. Um, and it is an excellent script. It can do, it can run any action, but I choose to use it for all of my plugins. So essentially when I have a track selected and I open the menu and I click Pro Q, it'll load up Pro Q on that track. 
And maybe if I just wanted to load it up on a specific media item, I can also just um, load it up on individual media items as well. It's pretty smart that way. Um, the part about it that is not smart is setting this whole thing up, which uh, basically to do it, um, you need to find the plugin. Um, I'm just going to pull this over here. Find the plugin you want to make a shortcut for. So let's say I want to make a shortcut for my favorite plugin, Huge Booty Bass Enhancer. Um, you will have to, sorry, it'll look like this. You right click, create shortcut, put in a dummy key that you want to map it to, click OK, go into the actions list, find the shortcut, type in the same dummy key that'll take you to the command that you just created. Right click on that, copy selected action command ID. Um, and then you need to open the radial menu setup, um, run that script. This brings up the editor. You bring up the sub menu that you want to add the button to. Um, you click add button, which will add a new button. Shift click on that button, change the label to be whatever you want. Huge booty. And then right here, you'll need to paste in that action command ID, which is just a large string of numbers and characters, and uh, you can close it and it should just work. Fingers crossed. Yep, there it is, huge booty on that track. So what you need to do is for every single plugin that you want to put in this menu, you have to go through that same process, which is really tedious, I know. And the kicker is if I wanted to, I could not just copy my setup um, and send it to all of you because A, you probably have different plugins than I do, but B, all the unique action command IDs that you saw me generate, I'm pretty sure are different for every computer because um, I've had to like reset this up on two computers because those were different. Um, so yes, you have to do that from scratch every time. The last little thing I wanted to share is what some of these beautiful buttons do. I'm just gonna run through a couple of the choice ones. Starting here, I have the snap enabled, which is bound to a keyboard control, but that either lock, it allows you to move things around freely or lock it to the grid, which to me, um, it's synced to time code, so it's like a frame, so you can move things one frame up or down. Um, here I have a couple little um, controls to show envelopes on media items. So this one shows the volume envelope on media items. This one shows the pan envelope, which can also be really handy for making like individual corrections. Um, and this one shows the pitch envelope. After that, I have a bunch of things about track colors and y'all probably don't care about that. The most interesting thing is probably that you can create gradients using the SWS gradient tool. This one's pretty cool. So let's say I had like a bunch of assets here that were spaced out really randomly and I wanted to make like a sort of boom library style sausage file. This uh, allows me to specify how much space I want either between the start or the end of them. And then it just consolidates them down and, and uh, bounces it into a single file with that space already added between them. And it also extends little handles on the start and the end, which can be pretty handy dandy. This one bounces things down to mono. Um, this one switches the channel order, so it switches left and right. This one's really great. This uh, bounces the live output to disk. It's sort of like the buffer, but essentially once I start this, it just like keeps recording everything that's happening in my session to a file. Um, then I have it um, ignore silences. So if I like get up and get a coffee in the middle of it and then come back, it doesn't record all that silence into the file. Then you run it again and it'll end the bounce and it has all that captured, which is great. These are all my screen sets. I'm not going to load them right now because it's going to make things look wacky, but I use different setups in different locations with different monitors. And this helps me keep all that organized. So like for creating YouTube videos, I have it set to load set three, which loads this like consolidated view. Then when I'm usually working, that's load set one. This one's actually cool, um, especially useful if you have like multi-track recordings from field recording sessions. It will um, take, your, uh, take your media item and explode all the individual tracks onto their own tracks. <laughs> <laughs> which is great if you need to create like sub mixes, like let's say channels one, two was a stereo pair of 8040s and channels three, four were like electromagnetic mics stereo pair. This allows you to separate those out and then create like uh, sub mixes for both of those um, and treat the channels independently if they were mono recordings as well. 
Then I have another one here, which uh, implodes to mono tracks to stereo, which is again, really useful when you have like stereo pairs that you intentionally want to treat that way. Skipping over a few things down here, I have all my NVK script buttons because I use those a lot. Probably the most uh, important one here. I think Nick made like uh, a new variation script or something that kind of makes this irrelevant, but I still use this old version of it. Uh, this creates, this is based on NVK takes, which I think is part of workflow. It creates these little markers on all of your files based on where the variations occur, like when they're sausage files. And then by clicking the next and previous variation button, you can like instantly make variations of your sounds by skipping the silences and going straight to the transients, um, which is really useful. I use that a lot. The rest of these are pretty niche as far as use cases go and not that interesting, so I'm not going to cover them. But that aside, if there was anything that I didn't cover that you were hoping I would, please let me know and I can follow up on that.